with different experiences uh, and uh, trying to tackle things that today are as important. Um, so, we're going to try to start now so that we have plenty of time for your questions, plenty of time for this uh, panelists that are extremely important through the topic. Um, and I would like to first start presenting myself. So I am Michaela Serafini. I am a medical doctor that comes from Argentina where I did all my studies as internal medicine and finished them in the London School with a public health uh, degree. I have been working with an NGO that is called Médecins Sans Frontières since 2004. That gave me a great opportunity uh, to, to work in what I want, uh, emergency medicine, and, and in those countries where today access is very difficult and needs are great. So I have been doing so, uh, as I was telling you, since 2010. Uh, sorry, since 2004, and since 2010, I have been working not so much in the field, but here in headquarters, and medical director of MSF Switzerland since 2014. So it has been a great pleasure when they invited me to chair this session, not only because of the great public, but also because of the great panelists we have over here, each of them with different experiences that are going to try to take us into this digital revolution. What does it mean? What do we need to expect? How do we need to do things from now onwards or even from yesterday onwards? So I will structure a little bit the plenary with the 10 minutes of uh, especially presenting the panel and speaking a little bit about digital health and what does it mean. Uh, and then afterwards we're going to be going straight into uh, questions to the panel. And uh, there's a very nice system where you can post your questions that afterwards will be uh, screened and they will be able to answer to your questions. Uh, and for that we will have plenty of time. So uh, just relax and enjoy uh, all this information coming to you. So speaking of which, digital health, uh, I was trying, when preparing this chairing, I was trying to uh, come up with a, a definition that was uh, simple enough for all of us to understand it without so complex uh, names and, 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 and information. And I think I came with one that is extremely simple. It has to do with combining science and technology. And the most important variable there is the time. So science has advanced so much and technology has just taken us over uh, that today we are in the right moment where those two combinations come up with this digital revolution. And this digital revolution is, is really something that, at least in MSF, we are conscious about it, but we are always running behind. And, uh, and we are speaking of, of this different initiatives like robotics and how can they influence our today care. We are speaking about computer simulation, how what we were forecasting, now we can now forecast it. We can be better in predicting. Uh, how today e-health has connected uh, care and has given the opportunity to uh, places where there's no health stuff, uh, simple algorithms can today diagnose and treat or can diagnose and then refer for treatment. We are speaking about virtual uh, reality and how that will help us to, to train people much better. Uh, we are also speaking, obviously, about artificial intel intelligence and, uh, and machine learning. That becomes uh, something extremely interesting today. And there are some of our panelists that are going to speak about that specifically. So all of which uh, is putting us in front of this digital revolution. And where do we want that digital revolution to impact? And always, obviously, we, we want that to gain, or we want from this digital revolution to gain much more into surveillance. We want to gain much more into precise diagnostics. Today, diagnostics are uh, being decentralized through point of care technology, and we are, we are able to get there to rural places where before we didn't even imagine we could. We're speaking about better treatment. This precision medicine, where a patient is taken as such and contextualized as such that the treatment becomes very, very personalized. We are speaking about prevention, how through digital we manage to communicate much further than before and how that impacts our community and their behavior. So all of which is, is really just enriching, uh, enriching our medical care, enriching, enriching our systems. But how, how do we get there? How do we make this transition where digital is coming and running behind, us, or we are running behind it. How do we incorporate this in our everyday life? How do we incorporate it in our job descriptions? How do we take them? 
Do we take them as competitors? Do we take them as complementing us? Do we take them as what? How do we absorb that? Uh, how, how does this transform the way we were trained, uh, where books were our main source? Um, uh, so we will have time to discuss all these aspects uh, through different uh, questions. And, uh, and today the most important thing is that we have very uh, real experiences. We have a telemedicine, a comprehensive telemedicine system that was implemented in Russia. And uh, we will have one of our panelists discussing and showing us a little bit of that. We have e IBM Watson. I'm sure that you are all aware about that experience. So we'll be discussing a little bit about that. Um, so, with that said, I would like to present you to our, each of our panelists uh, that are here for you uh, and, uh, and, to, and to discuss these matters. So we have in the first place Vanessa. Vanessa Candeyas, she comes from, originally from Portugal. So she's a very experienced public health expert working as head of the Global Health and Healthcare Initiative at the World Economic Forum. Before joining the forum, she worked with the Department of Chronic Diseases and Health Promotion in the WHO, uh, and also in the Ministry of Health of Portugal. She's a nutritionist by background uh, that was trained in Porto University and holds also a Master in Public Health from the London School. So thank you very much, Vanessa, for coming here. And um, secondly, we will have Roar John. Uh, Johansson, sorry. <laughs> so Roar, he's a medical oncologist that is working with the IBM Watson Health, and in there he's working as medical oncologist subject matter, matter expert. So he will be able to take us really through this called precision medicine. What does it mean in reality? How does it look like? So thank you, Roar, for coming. Uh, thirdly, we have Javier Comtesse. So Javier, he's a writer, he's a license in mathematics, he's a PhD in computer science at the University of Geneva. He has worked uh, extensively, so 10 years in the academia, 10 years as CEO, and 10 years with the federal administration, including seven as diplomat in the US. So lately, uh, he has been working, and since 2002, he has been working as head of the Geneva office of Avenir Suisse the first think tank in Switzerland in charge of the development of economic and social issues. So thank you, Javier, for coming. And last but obviously not least, we have Mikhail, Mikhail Netsenson. So he is coming from Russia, professor of the Division of Telemedicine and Health Informatics in People's Friendly University of Russia, chairman of the board of National Telemedicine Agency and member of the Council of Russian Telemedicine Consortium. He's also the vice coordinator of the working group on telemedicine of the Commonwealth in the field of telecommunication. So thank you, Mikhail, for coming. Great. So luckily, I am the chair, so I have the, 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 the chance of uh, having the first question. And in this case, I would like to, to ask uh, a question to Vanessa, in which case, uh, I would like to know that in your experience, Vanessa, what would be the main changes that digital technologies like, again, machine learning and artificial intelligence will, um, will bring to global health? Uh, how do you see that coming? Which are those consequences? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Michaela, for that question. And thank you to the University of Geneva for the invitation to be part of the panel today. So in preparing for this session, I, I had multiple ways in which I wanted to cut, cut this cake. But uh, trying to be succinct and in World Economic Forum style, uh, I, I bucketed in three main cat categories. So the first one that I see a big impact and a, a big area for transformation is around uh, data, in terms of the data that is going to be available, uh, uh, the data that is how data is being collected, how data is being analyzed, the speed at which this data is being both collected and analyzed, and then made available for the decision maker. And I know we're going to be talking a little bit further about that. And the fact that we're going to have such a wide variety of, of data 
healthcare delivery system, that's going to mean that the, those that are providing care are going to have to be able to digest that information in a way that makes it actionable for the patients. And so all of that, I think, is going to have a tremendous impact into how uh, the, the, the healthcare professionals and then the interaction with the patients and behind the healthcare professionals with the healthcare delivery system is going to be uh, quite different as we progress with our use of the data and, and how we leverage the data that is available. The second area where I think there's going to be a very important uh, uh, impact is in the transformation of the actual healthcare delivery system. So uh, we see that in many of the mature economies, there's a big shift and a big trend to move from uh, fee per service to fee per outcome, meaning uh, moving from my doctor gets paid when uh, me when it measures my blood pressure to my doctor gets paid when I, as a patient, get my blood pressure under control. Now, that can only happen in an efficient way if, again, there's a, 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 an informatics backbone that allows for all of these transformations to happen, that will allow for the transformation of the reimbursement models and the payment models in a way that uh, uh, is uh, uh, efficient and that it works both from the payer and the provider aspect. And then it also means that the, the nurse or the physician is not going to spend uh, hours trying to figure out how to then deliver the best outcome for the patient, right? So I think the how we are going to be able to leverage technology to help with that shift is going to be tremendously uh, uh, important in uh, how we're going to see the, the healthcare delivery system uh, uh, delivering care in uh, five to ten years. And so we see this in mature economies. And in emerging economies, I think the, uh, a big part of the transformation, and, and no doubt, I think that both healthcare delivery systems need to move towards uh, outcomes-based, whether independently of the stage of, uh, of, of, of maturity where that system is. Uh, now, what happens is, uh, in emerging economies, the systems have are not at the same level of, of, of development when it comes to the informatics uh, backbones, when it comes to the electronic medical record, all of that infrastructure. And so a lot of the innovations that we're going to see uh, coming up, they will enable many of those uh, healthcare delivery systems in emerging economies to leapfrog to a system that is uh, incredibly more efficient and that it works better for the healthcare professionals that are delivering the care and for the patients that are going through their, their patient experience. And then the third area that I would uh, highlight is that we know that, you know, by 2050, we expect to have uh, more than 2 billion people in the planet that are over the age of 60. And that means that we're going to have a, a, a profile, a landscape of diseases where you have people that have a, a cluster of conditions. They're going to be having not just their cardiovascular uh, uh, diseases, they're going to be combined with uh, either depression or anxiety or diabetes, or uh, they're going to be uh, survivors from cancer. So it's uh, the, 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 the picture of, of each patient is going to be quite different from or not quite different, but it's going to be even more uh, pronounced than what, what we see now. And I believe that a part of managing that, it's going to mean that a lot of the treatments are going to move from the hospital, from tertiary care, to the home. And that can only happen if it is technology enabled. That can only happen also if we have a workforce that is able to move from a doctor-centric approach to an approach where you have highly trained and highly skilled nurses, social workers, medical um, or healthcare professionals that are delivering and supporting patients at home. And they then would have all of the technology uh, um, products that would allow them to do the patient monitoring, uh, be it remote monitoring at home, be it, for example, uh, uh, treatment adherence, which some of the innovations that we now see with uh, the digital pill are enabled at the moment. So I think we're going to see a, a, a much larger trend towards home care, and all of that is going to be influenced uh, uh, through the, the digital uh, landscape. Thank you, Vanessa, very much. And, uh, and maybe just to 
to add a little bit, if you can tell us, how could we, I mean, uh, today digital is really a, quite of a, of a spoiled matter in developed countries, but how can we speed uh, this technology in developing countries? Do you think there is a formula that could help us out on that, taking into account that probably the needs that digital is solving us today are much more over there? So, I absolutely agree. I think digital and, and technology is going to be critical to the development of, of the health and healthcare infrastructure in developing uh, countries. Now, where we cannot it's, we cannot fall into the trap of having technology just for the sake of technology. So the technology and services and, and apps and products and innovations, they need to be serving the needs and the gaps of, uh, of the population. And so I think in, in having this in mind, it highlights the important role that govern, governments need to be playing in terms of, of, of setting the priorities for their, their, the health of their population, in setting the direction where they want to go and the pace of this transformation. And so really, uh, it, it's a matter of finding the balance where all of these innovations can be serving the needs of the population and the policies uh, that governments uh, put in place. And then obviously, I think that everything else in terms of decreasing costs, in terms of speeding uh, access uh, uh, to treatment, in terms of speeding diagnostics and, and point of care, all of that is going to come into place and we will see some of the uh, of the countries uh, being able to do some of the leapfrogging to uh, over the the issues that we saw in uh, mature economies uh, the world economic forum did quite a, a large piece of work on this concept of of leapfrogging for uh, emerging economies and we saw that there were a couple of areas where this was uh, most promising and that they would be enabled by technology. So in terms of, of, of the, the services, of course, in terms of the products that were being offered, uh, the technologies that were being made available, and then in terms as well of the behavior. Uh, and how, not just the behavior of the patients and the individuals in their daily lifestyles, but also the behavior of the, the health workforce. And so that, I think it's going to be critical to leverage uh, technology uh, so that you can be bringing all of this together in a way that is meaningful for the, the advancing the, the, the health agenda that each government has set for its own population. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, Roar, I have a, a specific question for you, and I know that as an oncologist you are in charge of a disease that today we think, uh, I mean, the advances are great, probably the advances that need to happen, again, in developing countries should be increased, but you were speaking to me on precision medicine. Could you develop a little bit more on your experience with IBM on that matter? Yes, um, first of all, I would say that we have a huge challenge in oncology in the future coming years. So within the next 20 years, we expect something like 40% increase of, of new cancer incidents, which says something, we're going to be a shortness of oncologists and, and oncology nurses pretty soon. So uh, IBM has been focusing on developing uh, a, a decision supporting system in, in order to uh, help the oncologists and uh, in order to uh, avoid the unwanted variation and to get a more precise treatment of patients. Basically what it means that uh, uh, we have developed one system which calls the Watson for Oncology, which is uh, uh, a system uh, trained by thousands of patient cases retrospective uh, uh, by the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, uh, which is uh, giving us by helping, by help of the experience from previous treated patients is supporting us how we're going to treat future patients. However, this is just a, 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 um, regarding the treatment, but in, in precision medicine, we also need the additional information from the genetics. Uh, we need the mutations, and already we know how to find a lot of these mutations. We're still struggling with how to connect it to the clinical findings and the treatment. Today, we have also something called Watson for Genetics, which gives us uh, enormous uh, genetical information about the mutations. And by connecting uh, this system, uh, which is more or less impossible for even a trained oncologist, you need so much time for this. Uh, by having this uh, digital information, 
you in seconds can have the information of genetical findings connected to the clinical findings and, and comes up with a, a treatment suggestion or support. This is, this is what we've been talking about the whole time, how to get a personalized medicine, how to avoid over-treatment of patients, which is really a big concern in many cases, and how to get the best focus on those who really need that. And, and to try to explore it a little bit more, so how this has changed uh, or not the way doctors address patients? Uh, has it changed the way that today we suggest? Is that doctors are much more sure of themselves when they suggest the treatment thanks to this? I think it, uh, by getting access to the system, it helps us to, to look into the whole forest of guidelines. We have so many guidelines right now. Uh, for European countries, Nordic countries, America, Asia. So it's, it's giving us a tool to easily and faster getting a more precise information of which treatment you should choose on. And I think everyone have the benefits of these ex previous treated patients, which, so it's a democratic process where you actually get access to data you never had before. So for the patient, he shouldn't be lucky if he find a trained oncologist or if you actually get the same oncologist the next day. Here you can actually uh, get the treatment based on, on this supporting system, knowing that he have the enhanced data which actually tells him which treatment has been proven to be the best, and of course the personal judgment and experience on that. And again, I'm fascinated by the issue. When, when we want to go further, so... Um, IBM Watson, uh, I wonder how much of research has it been going on on this specific uh, model and specifically on oncology and how do you measure impact of this uh, digital instruments that today are coming in, big data that today is exploding with, uh, again, coming to a more precision uh, diagnostic. So if you can develop that a little bit. So developing this system is a dynamic process and uh, uh, Watson for Health has, and for Oncology has been for quite a few years now. However, for each year, we, we're including more and more tumor organs into it and more and more uh, stadiums of the, each disease. So even this year, we're going to include more, of, more different cancer cases. However, one example which is actually measurable is uh, what we call the uh, trial matching. We know on the worldwide generally, there's about four to 7% uh, of patients being included into clinical trials in oncology, which is a really, really low number. And uh, uh, by using the clinical trial matching system, we can increase way this possibility for patients to get access to new trials, which of course means new possibilities to actually survive. It helps pa uh, patients to find trials and also, when you establish a trial, you can actually help to find patients in different hospitals who could be included. This is a particular, uh, we know that uh, uh, clients who actually use our system, having, some of them have already increased from 10 to 80% of including patients, which, which I think is a quite fantastic number and a and good example of how this can have an impact on uh, patients' access to precision medicine. Thank you very much, Rora. I'm sure that the public will have questions for you on that matter. Um, I would like maybe um, Mikhail has, uh, he will be spe speaking in Russian. So if you have uh, your translator machine, please get it. Um, he will uh, probably take us through his experience on the comprehensive telemedicine system and its implementation, even with a small film that will illustrate a little bit the matter. So I'll, there you have the mic, and uh, I'm happy to, to hear to your experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, I began by English because uh, digital revolution in healthcare is international process. <laughs> And I know, uh, we know all uh, that uh, official language in uh, international city, Geneva, Russian, French, Spain, Arabic, and Russian. I, I, I use this possibility. Thank you. Я хочу сказать, что мы все говорим о цифровой революции 
в здравоохранении. Но почему-то забываем, что когда померили температуру больного и обнаружили, что она 36,6, то это был первый опыт цифрового использования в здравоохранении. И в здравоохранении, в мировом здравоохранении есть три константы. Первая константа, к сожалению, половина первичных диагнозов, которые ставят врачи, неверна, она ошибочна. И сделать ничего нельзя. Человек настолько сложен, что врачи пока еще не умеют распознавать все болезни. И это приводит, эти ошибки в диагностике приводят к ужасным экономическим последствиям. Только потери здравоохранения США на лечение по неправильным диагнозам составляет сотни миллиардов долларов. В России такая же ситуация, только потери составляют сотни миллиардов рублей. Поэтому, конечно, все страны жалуются, все министры здравоохранения жалуются, что недостаточно денег, но если неправильно ставить диагноз и неправильно лечить, не хватит никаких денег. Поэтому врачи традиционно пытаются решить проблему правильного диагноза, приглашая на консилиум своих более квалифицированных коллег. И оказалось, что количество таких консилиумов – это тоже мировая константа. Количество консилиумов составляет от 5 до 8% от численности населения страны в год. То есть в 140 миллионной России проводится примерно в год 12-15 миллионов консилиумов. А это бизнес-процесс, и он должен быть организован. Понятно, когда мы сидим в замечательной Швейцарии, где есть ассоциации клиник Женевского озера, которая замечательным образом собрала у себя лучших врачей и практически может вылечить любую болезнь. И если мы вдруг от... повернемся на юг, то мы узна... увидим, что в Африке не то, что э... нет хороших, нет, нет достаточной инфраструктуры здравоохранения, э... то понятно, что никаких консилиумов вы организовать не можете. Такая же проблема в, в сельской местности, в удаленных и труднодоступных районах. Примерно половина населения Земли из 7 миллиардов, примерно 3,5 живет в сельской местности. Там нет и достаточной инфраструктуры здравоохранения. И вы реально не можете оказать квалифицированную помощь. Поэтому понятно, что реальная потребность в таких консилиумах, в таких консультациях значительно выше, чем эти миллионы консилиумов, которых мы имеем сейчас. Но оказывается, есть еще одна мировая константа в мировом здравоохранении. Оказывается, что если вы ставите диагноз на ранней стадии болезни, то лечение ее более успешно и дешевле в 10 раз. А, к сожалению, в большинстве случаев пациенты попадают в больницы уже тяжело больные. И поэтому опять получается, что эффективность использования средств здравоохранения чрезвычайно низкая. И вот так устроена жизнь, что если она подкидывает, предлагает какие-то проблемы, ставит задачи, то она, как правило, предлагает решение. Вот то, что мы здесь обсуждаем, цифровизация здравоохранения, это то самое решение, которое позволяет решить эти задачи. И одним из направлений цифровизации является телемедицина. Если можно, презентацию. Ну, пока нету. Я продолжу. Что такое телемедицина? Телемедицина – это возможность дистанционно оказывать консультации региональному врачу, в удаленном месте, в, удал... в сельской местности, с более высокими специ... специалистами более высокой специализации. Врачи в Москве, 
в Нью-Йорке, в Женеве, могут помочь дистанционно своему коллеге в сельской местности, в Африке, в Азии, в Латинской Америке, на островах океане и так далее. И так далее. Значит, при этом одновременно решается целый ряд проблем благодаря этим цифровым технологиям. Вы получаете, каждый человек реализуется его право получить медицинскую помощь, независимо от того, какой, на какой ступень на социальной лестнице он находится и где он живет. Это первое право человека. И второе, пациент получает возможность получить одинаковую медицинскую помощь одинакового высокого стандарта качества. То есть это означает, что любой человек в мире может получить абсолютно одинакового высокого качества помощи. Но при этом, что очень важно, вы повышаете благодаря цифровизации качество этой помощи, делаете ее доступной для каждого, но при этом вы еще оптимизируете расходы на здравоохранение. Это чрезвычайно важная проблема. Ну, я не говорю уже еще о четвертой возможности, что благодаря цифровизации создается большое количество рабочих мест для людей высокой квалификации. Таким образом, получается, что цифровизация несет с собой решение очень многих проблем, которые просто сейчас реально столкнулось с честь. Простите, что я говорю таким высоким стилем, но это просто реальные результаты. И вот, к сожалению, тут не получается с моей презентацией, с моим видеоклипом. Я хотел продемонстрировать, как это все делается в деталях, потому что, знаете, по-русски говорят, что дьявол зарыт в деталях, а тут Бог зарыт в деталях. И мы разработали в России, реализуем... No, no, no. Мы can, реализу... we, can we put the video on? If, if it possible. I think they, uh, they might. Uh, so there's a short video uh, that Mikael oh, would like it's, to... Well, it's first slide of my... Perfect. Maybe you, uh, uh, quickly. It's special. So, to, 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 to. Digital, very quickly. Yeah, if, okay. Uh, we develop special project, universal project, national telemedicine system uh, for different country. It's for our leader, our session from Argentina, and I prepare as example a project for Argentina Republic. With pleasure. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, this, uh, this slide, you see that uh, four goals of, main goals of telemedicine system. Uh, uh, we use uh, document of United Nations and uh, World Health Organization because in uh, 2008 uh, special e-health resolution uh, from World Health Organization about digital uh, healthcare. It's uh, our activities and it's, you see the national telemedicine system of Argentina Republic include two parts. Uh, one part is a network of uh, stationary uh, telemedicine consulting center in uh, clinics all level from uh, capital city clinic to a small uh, clinic in small village. It's all this telemedicine consulting uh, network is uh, communicate with uh, mobile uh, system of mobile telemedicine units, mobile clinic, uh, which work in rural area for people uh, live in rural area, long distance uh, area. And uh, we use satellite communication because not only satellite, fiber optic, all possibilities for communication. And 
uh, uh, telemedicine is principle uh, transboundary uh, 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 project, transboundary technology, and uh, using national telemedicine system, uh, you can uh, connect with uh, best clinic in the world. Uh, it's Lausanne Clinic, uh, uh, hospital in Brooklyn, I don't know. It's uh, the best clinic in the world. And uh, this situation, in <laughs> my colleague from Brazil, uh, Professor Messina, uh, leader of uh, telemedicine network of university in Latin America in Brazil, is include this connection with this system. Uh, the telemedicine system, it's not simple system, it's four level system, a regional, province, uh, level, uh, federal level, state level, and international level. We can connect with uh, uh, Watson and uh, receive in small village in Naura Islands uh, uh, answer for your question to uh, Dr. Watson. It's uh, very important to organize not only use telemedicine equipment. We, telemedicine as a system, complete system, need to using um, organized structure. In this slide, we demonstrate how organized. And it's very important, special for my colleague from World Economic Forum. It's this, uh, this uh, macro model, how um, you receive, if you use telemedicine system, how you receive optimized budget for healthcare. Sorry, it's impossible to say, but 10 times, not 10%, 10 times. Really? Dif different sphere using of telemedicine system uh, from uh, personal home telemedicine system, gender problem and uh, it's uh, clinical uh, consulting, uh, it's uh, epidemiology situation, and so, so, so. Hot point, uh, after emergency situation, you can use the telemedicine system in different uh, sphere. It's a very interesting part of this system, very interesting solution. It's this, you, you looked, uh, maquette of mobile telemedicine clinic, this mobi mobile clinic uh, work, uh, work in rural area. It's uh, one mobile clinic can uh, support uh, for 20,000 people per year. It's a very large hospital. But, and this mobile clinic absolutely autonomically. Power, uh, communication, and uh, all uh, equipment with uh, computers, digital, so, so, and stuff of this mobile clinic uh, can be not high quality. It's very important for digital. Nurses. But for diagnostic, transfer uh, medical uh, uh, information to high quality physician, to Dr. Watson, and so, so, so. And, and in, yes, I, 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 maybe if I, I can just ask yes. uh, in the middle. So I think that uh, you have exposed us a system that, uh, that seems to be uh, extraordinary and working, and it can be international. I think that there is plenty of platforms of telemedicine here and there. Why, uh, why is this one so good compared to all the other ones? Uh, what is it? Is that you manage to get more users into it? Is it that the system is very simple and it can be applied everywhere? So what makes the difference with your platform, with the, the hundred of telemedicine platforms that we have today? No, no different because we use the same international standard for uh, transfer medical data and uh, uh, other data. It's uh, absolutely complete with uh, different system. It's no problem. It's, it's, it's not problem for us. It's not problem for uh, physician, for technical uh, person which supports the system. Because I repeat it, we use international standard. And uh, just thinking of 
uh, again, those places that are extremely rural and difficult to access. H how about connectivity? How do you manage? You have an offline and an online. How, how does that work? Uh, it's uh, usually, it's uh, healthcare is government system. Only United States is uh, more, more part is private. Um, I am member of expert group uh, by healthcare between Russia and uh, United States, and I, I was in Washington. In uh, I repeat it, I I member of expert group uh, from uh, healthcare between Russia and United States, and I was in Department of Health and Social Services in Washington. It's the same as the Minister of Healthcare in Russia. And we discuss with our colleague the same problem. No problem. Telemedicine, I repeat it, using international standard. It's very important. Telemedicine technology, transboundary technology. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's very important. That okay. My clinic for in the United States using this technology can be support. Uh, people in Zimbabwe, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, yes, it's this slide is different medical information for uh, very important tuberculosis. You see, uh, it's mammography, it's an, 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 uh, oncology, and uh, different surgery. Very important problem. Um, uh, medical support for women. Yeah. It's seriously a problem. A special solution by a clinic for women. It's, and, you uh, see the mammography and so, so, so. I invite the public to see the, the little maquettes that it's over there <laughs> with the details of unfortunately, how it works. Unfortunately, the really working uh, mobile uh, unit, uh, 13 tons. <laughs> it's impossible uh, here. But that illustrates yeah, it very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You see that uh, special sea uh, ship uh, with uh, telemedicine uh, functions. It's very important for uh, islands, countries. Uh, for example, Ebola epidemic in Africa because not enough infrastructure. This uh, ship uh, drive to, to this country. It's begun uh, to organize help. It's the same. The same. Uh, solution for Riva is the emergency situation, epidemiology situation. It's our diploma from Geneva too. Great. Uh, we demonstrated this mobile unit as a, a full uh, position in Geneva in 2003. And it's this, uh, you see, uh, this mobile unit work in South Africa and so, so, so. So you have a very big range of experiences. Yeah. Through it. Okay. Yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting. Oh. Sorry. It's been Sorry. April 2005 when a mobile telemedicine laboratory equipped specialized vehicle arrived in Perm. It had been properly ceremonially seen off in Moscow for Perm. The miracle vehicle emergence had been initiated by Ralaiu Insurance Company into Regional Clinic, making reasonable the host of Per Moscow Television Bridge. Telemedicine Laboratory is a joint venture inscribing Perm Region, Orala Yield Insurance Company, Tana Group of Companies, Vitanet Company and International Communications Operator, Oral Svazin Forum. Precision equipment, armed to teeth Kamaz, has been assembled on one of the Moscow Region factories by a special order. It has now analogs in action within Russia. Mobile telemedicine laboratory makes necessary population effective screening researches possible and include X-ray, ultrasound, hematological, morphological and biochemical researchers as well as functional tests. Besides, heavy conditioned patients are guaranteed to receive qualified instructions. Moscow and St. Petersburg experts will be answering questions of interest and the nearest plans are to get foreign experts to take part in the project. We are currently negotiating with Zurich Universal Clinics and their authorized delegate is about to appear in Perm to establish the right communication with the Zurich Clinics.
First mobile laboratory patients have a certain of the polyclinic's top-level feeling. Certain appliances can be hardly found even in big hospitals. High-frequency machinery is serviced by trained people. Radio diagnostics expert has the priority because digital photofluorographic unit and ultrasound scanner are of the major importance here. Testing and screening laboratory representative is important as well. Laboratory assistant has an opportunity to contact clinics at any time to receive a heavy accident advice. As early as mid-April, Uralail Mobile Telemedicine Laboratory has left for Yekaterinburg to become mid-girls adornment in a day. Hanover International Fair tend to be an informational reason to visit neighbor region. Stands and displays were numerous. Tana Group of Companies Mobile Telemedicine Laboratory was the biggest of them. It was decided to arrange satellite television bridge on its basis to connect to RLIU Laboratory. Ural's Federal District Plenipotentiary Governing Body Staff paid attention to the major project target, public health modernization. National health is primary for the state. Nowadays, we can be sure that this act will increase the quality and importance of medical service, making it publicly available. Though, we count on your support. Some words for the press and bureaucracy went on an excursion. Doctors were pleased to demonstrate unique hospital abilities, though limited space has limited the attendance and interested persons were put on a waiting list. All the rest were given a possibility to contemplate processes by means of plasma panels and to get to know Hanover novelties. It was Leonid Raymond, the Minister of Informational Technologies and Communication, that made himself available online to Yekaterinburg. He made some brief salutatory addresses and warm wishes of his trip. Unique Kamaz is ready to get back to its home city, Perm. We understand that rural regions lack up-to-date equipment and experts, as it's mainly concentrated in the center. Our goal is to carry out healthy population. We are, in fact, working in accordance with the presidential program National Health to increase the lifetime. Mobile telemedicine laboratory covers the whole Urals region. Creators see no borders to stop the Land Rover. Kamaz will reach the destination point even through the swamps, as the vehicle body is composed of various materials, constantly protecting precise equipment and people being tested. Okay, so thank you for that. I think that uh, good work, Kelly. Okay, you have this trial. And, uh, and the film, we really get uh, the idea of how complex it is, but how useful and, and at which point it can be developed and, and, and taken further. Great. Is you, see, you see that this mobile telemedicine clinic drive to you. It's first. <laughs> it, uh, we um, include inside, for inside uh, a lot of special programs yeah. for automatically. Yeah. My colleague uh, demonstrated in the exhibi exhibition very interesting solution how okay. use uh, special new mathematician methods to find tuberculosis. Yes. We will try to move forward yes, yeah, yeah, and give yeah, 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 yeah. No, thank so, you. Sorry. No, no problem, no problem. Uh, so uh, now that we have that uh, specific uh, um, information on, on the comprehensive uh, telemedicine system that you have been working on, I would like to give the space uh, to Javier. So, Javier, you are a writer. Uh, you're a passionate writer, and artificial intelligence seems to be in the core of your thinking. So we would like to understand what is your thinking about, and, and to explain us a little bit about your thought. Alors, je vais parler le français. Peut-être il faut mettre vos écouteurs. Je ne sais pas <coughs> si vous ressentez le même malaise que moi, mais on a parlé sans arrêt de technologie de nouvelles technologies, de Watson, de télémé télémédecine, etc., etc. Et ces derniers jours, vous en avez vu partout. Et cette poussée, cette révolution technologique arrive à un moment euh, historique qui est vraiment le pire des moments. Tous les systèmes de santé dans le monde 
sont à bout de souffle. Tous. Les États n'arrivent plus à payer, n'arrivent plus à délivrer les promesses sur la santé. Et là, la technologie en rajoute une couche, mais tous, que ce soit le privé, que ce soit Novartis, tout le monde, en rajoute une couche. C'est impossible, ça ne va pas marcher. Nous n'avons pas les moyens de nous payer ça. Arrêtons deux secondes. <rire> le système est almost broke. Si vous allez en Angleterre, c'est à se tirer des balles. Si vous allez aux États-Unis, il y a peut-être 20 de la population qui arrivera à se faire guérir. Et là arrive cette technologie. Watson, c'est pas bon marché. Hein Et on a un problème de fond. Est-ce que ces technologies ne pourraient pas plutôt servir à diminuer les coûts Voilà mon hypothèse. Et la réponse est oui. L'intelligence artificielle pourrait, un peu comme il l'a esquissé avec la télémédecine, on devrait et on pourrait, et ce serait peut-être une mission pour le WEF, mobiliser le monde entier pour descendre les coûts de la santé. En Suisse, pays hautement médiciné, 30 000, personnes, 30 000 personnes ne payent plus le prime. Ils n'ont pas les moyens. Et c'est que le début. Le système français est à bout. Et donc, il faut arrêter. Maintenant, il faut se dire, est-ce qu'on ne peut pas, au lieu de continuer cette fuite en avant, qui a comme conséquence, regardez aujourd'hui, euh, en Suisse, mais bon, ailleurs, ça a été... Aux États-Unis, c'est un peu les pharma, mais en Suisse, c'est les médecins qui sont accusés d'être trop chers. Les médecins par la population, par les hommes politiques, ils sont attaqués dans les journaux. Voilà. Est-ce qu'on ne devrait pas, tout d'un coup, dire « Oh, il y a urgence, il faut baisser les coûts du système de santé ». Et c'est possible. Figurez-vous que si vous allez regarder les statistiques, 20 20 des actes médicaux sont inutiles, voire dangereux. Il l'a dit. Tous les études le confirment. Ce n'est pas seulement vrai en Russie, c'est vrai chez nous, c'est vrai partout. Pourquoi ben Un peu parce que les patients poussent, un peu parce que les médecins poussent, un peu parce que tout le monde pousse. Voyez 20 sont inutiles. Ça veut dire que 20 des frais sont inutiles, voire dangereux, voire dangereux. Il l'a dit aussi, voire dangereux. Donc, voilà, commençons par des choses aussi simples que ça. Est-ce que l'intelligence artificielle ne pourrait pas, comme c'est le cas dans les assurances, je vous rappelle que les grandes assurances comme AXA, Allianz, ont mis en place des systèmes d'intelligence artificielle pour regarder qu'une seule chose, des fausses déclarations de sinistres. En Suisse, pays exemplaire, 10% des déclarations sont des faux. Imaginez-vous ce qui se passe en Italie. Il y a urgence. On sait le faire. Pourquoi la médecine ne le fait pas Pourquoi le système ne se dit pas « Waouh On a un problème, on va avoir la population contre nous. Fixons ce problème. Si vous économisez 20% des coûts, à ce moment-là, on peut faire sa télémédecine. À ce moment-là, on peut faire Watson. Mais pas avant, vous voyez Mais ce n'est pas le seul domaine. Euh, ce domaine-là, des actes médicaux inutiles, Évidemment, il est criant, mais il y en a d'autres qui sont tout aussi criants. Les maladies chroniques. Pourquoi pas avoir des systèmes d'intelligence artificielle qui aideraient les patients de ces maladies chroniques On pourrait économiser énormément. Les maladies chroniques, c'est un des coûts les plus importants du système. On ne fait rien. Je veux dire, c'est de la consommation, c'est du free lunch, hein notre système. Et tous est en train de, de péter. Hein, il, faut, il faut être sévère, là. Les infections nosocomiales, ça, c'est le sommet. Vous allez à l'hôpital, vous ressortez malade. Vous voyez mais à Genève, il y a un mec qui a inventé. Lavez-vous les mains. Non, mais attendez, c'est nul, quand même. Se laver les mains, et à, à ce moment-là, les infections nosocomiales sont finies. Mais vous êtes fous, ou bien non, soyons sérieux, c'est un problème sérieux. 40 on sont chopés à l'hôpital, vous voyez Bon, <rire> il y a un problème. Alors au début, j'ai cru qu'on avait fait 
cette médecine ambulatoire pour résoudre ce problème. Vous voyez, il restait moins longtemps, donc il avait moins de risques de choper de l'infection. Mais ce n'est pas du tout le cas. Hein. On a fait de l'ambulatoire parce que ce pas les mêmes qui payent. Vous voyez, ce pas les mêmes qui payent. Alors voilà, on fait de l'ambulatoire. Mais c'est un peu stupide. Vous allez le matin, vous ressortez mort le soir. Quoi. Donc, c'est sérieux ce que je dis. Hein. Les infections nosocomiales, ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on doit résoudre en se lavant les mains. Il faut les suivre, chacune sont différentes. Il faut que les gens soient avertis. Il faut qu'on ait l'IA, cette IA sur un téléphone mobile. Quand je vais voir quelqu'un, je sais ce que je dois faire. Vous voyez Aujourd'hui, je rentre dans un hôpital, je me rapasse tout, et je ne sais pas, je ne vois rien. Vous voyez les microscopes, ils ne sont pas... Les, les, les infections, elles ne sont pas là en train de dire « Attention, je suis là. Vous voyez » et Je ne sais pas quoi faire. Et c'est une machine infernale. Donc, ce n'est pas propre. L'endroit le plus sale point de vue maladie, c'est l'hôpital. C'est quand même un comble, vous voyez Mais Faisons ce travail, vous voyez, au lieu de dire, voilà, ils n'ont qu'à payer les gens. Ce n'est pas vrai, ils ont arrêté de payer. Et l'État non plus n'a pas l'argent. Et il y a plein de pistes comme ça. Évidemment, Watson comme second avis, évidemment, la télémédecine, c'est super comme idée, on peut descendre les coûts. Mais s'il y avait une attitude, et je propose que le WEF prenne ça en charge, en disant, maintenant, c'est un problème mondial, nous allons couper les coûts de la santé par deux. Et c'est possible. Par deux, vous voyez, l'ambition. 20% déjà avec les maladies, les, euh, les traitements inutiles, les actes inutiles. Mais, mais tout, vous voyez. Et on attaque ce problème d'une manière extrêmement sérieuse. Après, on se donne tellement, on a répondu tellement aux besoins de la société qu'ils nous referont confiance au monde médical. Aujourd'hui, vous avez perdu la confiance. Vous êtes des gens qui, qui ont abusé. Vous avez abusé du système. C'est ça que la population pense de vous. Point. Merci. Voilà. <laughs> so, what do we do with all this? Uh, I think that Ro wanted to react, but I also please ask all the public to react into this, and we are going to take some questions from the public. Well, first of all, I think it's, it's great to have some di discussions about this and uh, to have an economic uh, aspect into it is, of course, important. If what we develop and what we do just bring more cost into the system, yes, that's, that's not the direction we want to go. But let me tell this, doing mistakes also costs. It costs a lot, not just money, it costs lives. If we are ignoring the knowledge we do from experience, treating p patients wrong, I think we are ignoring the knowledge thousands of health people do every day. Now we have a chance to get open access to very important studies, knowledge and practice from really clever people. I think not bringing their knowledge to everyone in the world, I think that costs way more. And I just want to give one example how uh, a system can actually save money because uh, we are aware today that mammography is one important way to make a diagnosis of breast cancer. It's getting everywhere in the world. We do a lot of mammography, and there's no doubt about it that we do too much. A lot of people get a half diagnosis. Mm, this could be benign, it could be malignant. If we continue just making control and control of these patients, it costs money. It, it costs a lot of doctors. Someone have to look at these pictures, and these patients come in and out. By using the, one of the systems IBM has developed through uh, mammography imaging, by a trained system, it can more clever than a clinician see who does have a diagnosis or a finding which should be followed up, and who actually have a normal finding. If we can focus on those who have a malignant or a pre-malignant condition, and forget about those who actually have a normal finding, I think we save money and we increase the focus on those who actually need it. Yeah, yeah but you know, your approach is to say pay, and then in the future it will be less expensive. When they come to the shoe in Lausanne, they say, okay, what's going to cost you one million up front? One million up front. And then uh, in many years you will get your money back because what you say now. I'm not sure. I, I will tell you, give me a Watson system that will go down my cost today, and then tomorrow we can discuss. Just take the opposite attitude. Because my people don't want to pay more money. 
And that's my problem today, not tomorrow, today. And so Watson is not a good offer today. He tell you, spend your money, and you will see down the road someday in the future. You know, IBM did that for the, for the uh, informatic. It took 30 years before the company make money before the productivity came in the company. 30 years. In the health system, it will take 50 years, I can tell you. It's not a good approach. I am sure that Roar will want to answer to you. <laughs> of course, this is coming from my doctor's view, of the way you talk. But I think in public health and oncology, we're not talking about today. We're actually talking about tomorrow. Tomorrow is the most important thing. What is the best treatment in cancer treatment? That's not to get cancer. It's preventive medicine. How to learn and how to avoid by looking at data, making uh, analysis of data, we can avoid people getting sick, learning how to avoid to get cancer. Yes, it's boring. It's not, you're not making money today. But we know that 40% will increase in cancer incidence the next 20 years. We can't ignore the fact this is going to change just that part of public health. It's going to change by not thinking about tomorrow. We are ignoring our biggest duty in public health. Prepare a population. Preventing medicine is one of the most important factors, I think, in public health. And Vanessa has here also something to add. Thank you. So in terms of the, the costs of, of MCDs, that was something that the forum has looked into at, uh, uh, with a certain level of depth. So if we look at the period between 2012 and 2030, our estimations say that uh, mental illness, uh, cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease, cancer, and diabetes will cost to the global economy something in the order of $47 trillion. And this is a, a huge number. And so with this in mind, basically we looked at, okay, so these are not just costs to the healthcare system, these are not just costs to the patients, these are costs to society in terms of lost productivity, in terms of uh, uh, absenteeism, in terms of people getting removed from the workforce because they need to take care of their families. So all of this aggregated. So we looked at how could this burden be reduced and basically we grouped it in two ways. The first one is by investing in primary prevention of of chronic diseases. So helping populations not get to the same level of prevalence of disease that they now have. And we did this by, uh, there's a, this is very well documented from the WHO side, there's a, a series of best buys uh, of, of policy options that governments and, 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 and co be, with the cooperation of the private sector can be put in place to reduce uh, and to prevent these diseases. Now what the forum did was to look at the return on investment of those, of, of, of many of those interventions, and guess what? They pay off. They actually give you not just the, the positive health outcomes that you want, but also to those that are investing in these interventions, they will give you your money back and more. And so we did a series of case studies looking at uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease using, for example, an integrated healthcare delivery system in the US, and the return on investment for the prevention uh, uh, with the hospital, working with the communities on uh, changing lifestyle and giving people the medication that they needed to control their blood pressure and to maintain their conditions uh, uh, under a certain level, it, was, uh, uh, it had a cost benefit to the hospital. Granted, this hospital is both the provider and the payer. So, it, but still, the investment that they were making was paying off. The second area in which we need to work, then you're very right, is actually to look through the system itself and reduce the waste and reduce the inefficiency. And that's where then technology must play a very important role. And that's where we did, for example, in Atlanta, where we look at congestive heart failure, and we brought together uh, all of the providers, all of the all of the payers, the, 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 the government side as well, and look at just for this condition, not for all of the conditions, just for this condition, how can we improve the patient experience, improve the patient uh, outcome, and then reduce the costs from the system side. And so that, that work is going to take us uh, 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 three years, and we're replicating that similar setup for diabetes in Canada, for example, for uh, uh, strokes in Singapore. So we should be able to have more information to share on how the, the delivery, 
the cost of the deliver is actually reduced by leveraging technology, but most importantly, by putting the patient's needs at the center so that you're not just cutting costs for the sake of cutting costs, you're actually providing a, a better uh, service and a better outcome to the population you're trying to serve. I would like to introduce the public into this, and here is a question that seems a little bit tricky, so Salem is going to take us through it. Can we foresee that artificial intelligence may compensate shortage in healthcare resources, particularly in low and middle income countries? Do, yeah. Yes, it's also on the board. But uh, can we foresee that artificial intelligence may compensate shortage in healthcare resources, particularly in low and middle income countries? Um, I can try to answer that uh, by looking at oncology again. Uh, in my country, Norway, we have one oncologist would have something like maybe 15 patients a day. Quite calm, even if we find it stressful, it's quite calm. If you go to uh, uh, other countries, um, I don't need to name them, like one oncologist could have 100 patients a day. It's, it's just impossible to, con to keep the quality on each patient. And in this way, artificial <laughs> intelligence could be a big help for this doctor to actually make decisions with the same quality. And if you look at, I know that some countries in Africa, for instance, have three oncologists for the whole country. It's unbelievable. But by access to uh, artificial intelligence, he can actually have access to all the experience another country have who have another developed system. And in this way, we can share platforms and we can give access to our experience and uh, enhance data. And in this way, we can share information and improve the clinical experience. Uh, it, still, if you have shortness. And putting the other way around, so where we have resources, where there's plenty of doctors, nurses, and psychologists, how is digital health going to work? So is digital health going to replace? Are we going to have to reduce the workforce? Is that good? Is that bad? Is that going to be in making any economy? Uh, how do you foresee that? Um, and many colleagues ask me, are you going to replace me? <laughs> what will I do tomorrow? No machine ever can replace a doctor. You can't replace the thinking, the contact with patients. You can't replace the nurse and the, the care. But you might be able to differentiate about who need the specialist, who need to have the most trained eyes, and who maybe can get the best care from others. I think in the future we will see a shift of who is getting what kind of focus, and who needs what kind of experience and training. Uh, and ironic enough, I think that having this artificial intelligence, maybe the doctor or nurse even will get more time to have the personal contact with the patient. My, I, myself, as a clinician, I, I think I spend not more than 30% with a patient. The rest is sitting there manually doing the thing, which I think is totally a waste of time. So maybe it gives us the opportunity to turn our heads back and see eyes to eyes contact with patients. That is something that uh, some of us miss quite a lot. But Javier, you have something to say about it. No, but moi, évidemment, je suis pas d'accord. <laughs> C'est pour ça qu'on m'a invité, non? Mais le, on, on, pourquoi le médecin échapperait à, à, à cette situation qu'on connaît dans les autres métiers? Bien sûr que le médecin est en risque. Bien sûr. Je vois très bien dans 10 ans, 20 ans, des systèmes où il y a le quart des radiologues aujourd'hui, l'oncologue aussi, dermatologue. Non, mais je crois qu'il faut juste ouvrir les yeux. Il y a un monde qui, 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 technologique qui arrive et, et qui peut euh, assez facilement remplacer les médecins. Juste ouvrir les yeux, c'est possible. Un radiologue aujourd'hui, qui est quelqu'un de relativement beaucoup payé pour les systèmes, euh, Watson fait mieux. Beaucoup mieux. Et puis, il n'a pas d'humeur, Watson. Hein, il n'a pas... Voilà. Donc, ce n'est pas vrai. On l'a fait dans plein des métiers et je ne vois pas pourquoi la médecine échapperait. Ça, c'est ce qu'il a dit tout à l'heure. Il m'a dit à l'oreille quelque chose de très vrai. Nous sommes dans un système qui s'est construit sur les siècles avec quelques idées assez fortes 
qui font croire que le système est là pour toujours. Il n'y a aucune raison que le système soit là pour toujours. Il peut partir en, en banqueroute. Et d'ailleurs, si vous voulez, si vous regardez ce qu'a ce qu fait l'Angleterre, vous savez comment l'Angleterre gère la croissance de ses coûts En créant des files d'attente de patients. Vous voyez C'est un gros avantage, la file d'attente de patients. Soit il va en France se faire soigner, il n'est plus dans la file d'attente, soit il meurt dans la file d'attente. Ça vous coûte moins cher. Faites attention, le système, il est vraiment broke. Est, mon avertissement ici, il est, il est simple. Au lieu de faire des diagnostics sans arrêt, en, en fixant toujours le patient, regardez que le système ne peut plus le faire. Je prends un exemple très simple. Vous me dites, voilà, camion de pompier, vous voyez, vous êtes pompier. Hein, votre camion de pompier est en panne. Il y a un incendie. Vous ne pouvez pas aller l'éteindre. C'est ça que je veux dire. Le système est en panne, c'est le camion. Bien sûr que les pompiers ont fait un travail exemplaire en, étendant, en, en, en éteignant beaucoup d'incendies, en empêchant que, que des villes entières brûlent. Vous voyez Oui, bien sûr. Mais si le camion ne marche pas, tout le système est par terre. C'est ça que je dis. Et ça, vous ne voulez pas ouvrir les yeux. Et la technologie, il faut ouvrir les yeux aussi. La technologie peut remplacer des médecins dans certains cas. Je ne dis pas que ce sera tout, tout le monde. Mais, mais moi, moi, je ne suis pas très vieux, mais j'ai vu disparaître des métiers entiers qui ont disparu totalement. Il y avait dans les avions un mec qui faisait qu'on appelait le navigateur dans l'avion. Disparu, mais il était essentiel. Ce type-là, s'il ne savait pas où était l'avion, l'avion n'arrivait jamais. Vous voyez Un GPS, maintenant, loin, l'IA. Eh bien, le radiologue, c'est à peu près ça. Thank you, Javier. I would like to introduce uh, to this matter uh, Claire Somerville. So Claire Somerville is an executive director of Gender Center, a visiting a lecturer of interdisciplinary study in the Graduate Institute. And she would like to ask you a question, a very specific one. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask whether or not any of you can comment on the differences that the digital revolution is having on men or women, or the similarities, in fact. And a follow-up to that um, would be that, of course, the health service sector is mainly, in 80% of the case, um, uh, the health service workforce is, is women. And we've been talking a lot about the future of work here, I think, in terms of the way that technologies may be taking on, uh, sorry, uh, taking on different roles and artificial intelligence perhaps replacing doctors. Um, so I, w I wondered what you could, if you could comment on that. And also for Xavier, I wondered, as an um, artificial intelligence expert, is AI gendered? You, could you do the last comments uh, a little bit Sammy, louder? Is artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence gendered? Does it have gender? Uh, I would say yes, but we didn't discover yet. I think that's a, it's a very important question. I'd like to, my hope is that, for example, AI will completely uh, 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 delete all of the differences in terms of, 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 of gender pay. And if you probably saw the news on the, the UK NHS, where 80% of, of women are the, the, the healthcare workers, are the caregivers of the country, and they're paid 40% less. 40% less than women. 80% of the workforce is paid 40% less in one of the most uh, mature uh, 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 healthcare systems in the world. And that is appalling. So my hope is that AI will not have a gender and especially AI will not discriminate against women. And then the other thing that I, I think it's very important in terms of, of healthcare, and we see women being discriminated within the healthcare delivery systems all over the world. One of the things that I found that I learned last year and that I, I is just it was shocking to me, and I, every time I have the chance I talk about it, is that did you know that the artificial heart that you can, that you, you can implant will not fit the chest of 
uh, most of half the, the women. It was tested and designed for the dimensions of, of males. So it will not fit the chest of women. How can you be excluding half of your population from a life-saving device? So my hope is that technology will come and help fix of this, but behind technology, there are men and women. So we need to work through those, to break through those biases so that in effect, we have technology working with us women and not against us, uh, and, and working with all of us, men and women, to have a more uh, uh, equal system that will be inclusive of, of all genders, of all races, uh, because the same way that we talk about gender discrimination, if we go into race discrimination within the healthcare uh, delivery system, we will have a very long debate and we'll be here until 5 p.m. Juste une chose pour être précise. Effectivement, euh, ce qui marche dans l'IA aujourd'hui, c'est ce qu'on appelle les machine learning. Ce sont des algorithmes qui sont capables de digérer de très grandes quantités de données et qui, euh, c'est un choix d'algorithmes, et qui, euh, en fait, sont drivés par ce qu'on appelle des data scientists. C'est eux qui ont ces données, posent dessus des algorithmes et regardent les résultats. Ils ont plusieurs choix d'algorithmes. Ces algorithmes sont... On peut sans doute, euh, été, on peut regarder qui les a fabriqués, mais c'est surtout les data scientists l'important. Et moi, j'ai rencontré une femme data scientist à l'assurance la vaudoise, et elle a dit ce que vous avez dit. Ça m'a frappé parce que je n'avais pas senti ça. Et parce que, en fait, sur une automobile de Google, c'est pour ça que ça prend tellement de temps, tous les, tous les machine learning ont, sont supervisés aujourd'hui. C'est ça le stade actuel de l'intelligence artificielle. C'est déjà pas mal hein, ce qu'on sait faire, mais c'est supervisé. Et le superviseur, s'il est femme ou homme, c'est pas la même chose des résultats, dit-elle. Et je la crois. Il n'y a pas de raison que ce n'est pas vrai. Donc vous avez raison de vous préoccuper de ça. La seule solution pour ça, je vous le dis, c'est très simple. Envoyer des, des, des masses de femmes en mathématiques. Ça va être difficile, mais c'est ça la, la solution. Il faut changer les, les courants de formation. Si vous arrivez à persuader vraiment les filles que les maths, c'est pour elles, ça, c'est le pied. Vous changez le cours de l'histoire. Parce qu'en fait, à la fin, il y a des personnes derrière. Tous ces, tous ces... Alors, c'est plus le médecin, mais c'est quelqu'un d'autre. Donc, ouais, il faut faire ça. Thank you, Javier. We will get uh, one question from the public. If you can, sorry. This will be for um, uh, Macchio. Uh, how can technology reduce health inequalities within countries and between countries in order to overcome the social determinants of health inequities? Yes, of course. I'll repeat it again. Um, how can technology reduce health inequalities within countries and between countries in order to overcome the social determinants of health inequities? I repeat, I repeated that we use international standard for transfer medical data. It's tech, not technical problem. Really problem two, two problems. Language, because different medical catalogs in different countries, different uh, name of nurses. It's really problem. And uh, third problems, uh, uh, a lawyer in different countries. We need uh, uh, harmonization uh, law, law in different countries to legalization these telemedicine consult consultations. And uh, <laughs> uh, lawyer of government of states, it's seriously problem. We uh, began uh, find solution of. Uh, this problem maybe 10 years ago in a uh, frame of uh, CIS countries, former Soviet Union, uh, we uh, prepared uh, and the government signature uh, special uh, model law about telemedicine uh, consulting, telemedicine services. I think it's the first uh, time in the world that really transboundary law for uh, legalization and telemedicine consulting. Yes, it's uh, uh, a smile problem. It's uh, uh, time, uh, different time in uh, different countries. 
in New York, in Moscow, and you understand, in Tokyo. Night, day, sun, dark, and so so. I think it's a technical problem. The more convenient consultation from east to west, because time work uh, for consultate. Mm. We uh, really, we have experience maybe uh, million consultation, no problem. Okay. It's, it's organization. It's if, okay. if you have good organization, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that during your presentation on, on what telemedicine is and the, and the way you explain how it reaches, I think that we got really the idea of how, how today technology can help us to decentralize and get until the end. So great for that. I do have another question to whomever wants to pick it up. And, uh, and in this case has to do on how do we accompany uh, this change in our staff? So, um, and, and just to illustrate it a little bit with an experience, we do have in MSF a telemedicine platform. It took us almost seven years uh, to have that pick up. And it's just this year where we see that the number of questions that are getting into this telemedicine platform are really picking up and people are, tr are starting to understand the benefit of it. So how could we speed that up? How could we make people understand the, the advantages of technology? Is there any way of uh, speeding it up? Good question. Maybe answer. Mm, not uh, so detailed. Uh, I, w I would like to return to birth of cancer. Uh, we have a special mobile clinic to medical support of uh, women. I repeat that uh, one mobile unit uh, can be uh, organized um, medical support for 20,000 women per year. Uh, inside digital mammology equipment. Uh, if you uh, analysis screening, 20,000 women, group of risk, 3%. Near uh, 600 women. Uh, cost of treatment in uh, for study in Russia, in Russian ruble, uh, 600,000 rubles. It's near uh, 10,000 dollars. Uh, I really meant um, how do we accompany, so how do we, um, how do we show uh, staff um, the possibility of technology? How do we accompany them through the change? I'm sure that there are certain uh, tasks that today either doctors, nurses are doing that are going to be replaced by digital. So how, how do we prepare them for that? And, and maybe Roar there has an answer to it. I think one of the key words is collaboration. I think that uh, uh, these kind of wicked problems we have in front of us, if you want people to be on your team, you have to also show them the benefits. Uh, and the benefits is not just to improve the health, it's also uh, to meet the challenge with, uh, with the shortness of personal. It's also to show that you can save money by this. Uh, it, it, so you have, I think, a problem could be that you only pick up one team who, who think they can benefit from this, and this is not in, in this force you need all of them. The government have to be there, organization, pharmaceutical companies have to be there, uh, represents for the patients. This is so, this is so big, so in order to speed up this process uh, and to strengthen it, we have to be even better to inform everyone why they, why they should be on this team, what can we benefit from it, and I think that's still lacking. We have to build up the team stronger, yeah. But I was, uh, as I was uh, trying to, 
to say, I think the technology is just taking us over. Uh, it, the speed in which uh, things are changing as such, and behavior takes its time to change. And there's where I see a little bit of a decalage between how much technology is advancing and how much us, we are changing our behaviors. So it's a, a, it continues to be a fascinating topic. And we're going to get another question from the public, and we are almost finishing in time. Um, is it important today to have competencies like data scientists and NGOs such as MSF? Oh, so that's for me. <laughs> so, um, sorry, uh, if we have today competencies like data scientists, no, we don't have. I think we'd, uh, that we should. So data scientists in NGOs like MSF. I think that, again, uh, NGOs like us, and I'm going to speak only uh, in, on name of MSF, um, we are uh, still amazed on what we can do with technology. And I think we could uh, take much more benefit of it, especially what it gives us, and especially the access that it gives us. So no, but obviously uh, it's, it's something that, that should be coming, yes. Comment? Il faut que tu allumes le. J'avais envie de répondre à la question de MSF. Euh, on vient, nous tous, d'un monde de la statistique. Et dans le fond, la manière dont on a géré la médecine était une manière statistique. Un nombre de cas, euh, toute la recherche clinique, c'est de la statistique. Tout est de la statistique. Le problème, c'est que dans la médecine dont ils parlent, hein, que les, Amé les Américains appellent médecine de précision, c'est du data science. La data des scientifiques, le big data, ce n'est pas de la statistique. Du tout. Donc, c'est une interprétation des données non structurées où je cherche, avec des moyens topologiques, des figures cachées. Rien à voir avec la statistique. Alors, MSF, en urgence, prenez des data scientists. Les hôpitaux devraient prendre en urgence des data scientists. Nous sommes en train de switcher de société, une société basée sur la statistique, qui donnait, dans le fond, des prédictions plus ou moins linéaires, vers un monde qui est basé sur l'analyse des données non structurées, qui trouvera des formes topologiques. On change de monde. Oui Engager des gars, engager des femmes, engager tout ce que vous trouvez. Il y a urgence. So, we are coming to the end. We have the band that is reminding us that this session is going to be over in a few minutes. I would just like to conclude uh, a little bit with, um, again, I think we went through plenty of subjects. I think uh, we touched a little bit this digital revolution and its impact. How can it reduce or how can it boost today the health system, uh, the costs? How can it de democratize a little bit the access? Uh, we talk about getting there to the most remote places. Uh, can it replace us? Uh, can it just complement us? which is going to be our role in the future, which is going to be the role of digital in the future. And we also discussed about gender, and I think there was a nice conclusion out of it. So I would like to thank you uh, first uh, to our panel. It has been fantastic to be with each one of you, with your views. Uh, controversies came in. I think that you were impeccable in trying to defend your, your positions. I would like to thank the public. Questions were extremely pertinent and, uh, and, and sometimes tough to answer. And, uh, and probably close the session with a nice applause.